Welcome to Hired the Podcast. I'm your host, Travis Miller, and with me today, I have Omar Shaboob right here from Miller Resource Group. Omar heads up the uh, Material Handling, Logistics, and Robotics Division for us here. Omar, how long have you been here with Miller Resource Group? I've been here for six years, going on my seventh year. Going on seven. And uh, a story I'm sure I've heard in the past, but one I'm always curious about because this is a... Uh, a good term, an industry of orphans. You know, nobody that gets into the recruiting business really started in the recruiting business. What's your story? What's the, what's the, what's the story that led you to pick up a t- phone one day and call a candidate and say, I got a job for you? Absolutely. So I, uh, my background's in business. Um, I got a bachelor's degree in business, French and finance. French? And I didn't know that. Yes. <laughs> so um, why are we having you call France? <laughs> It's a great question. Um, so, uh, yeah, three uh, three majors basically, and um, I, I always liked enjoyed talking to people. Um, I was always customer facing in all my roles. Uh, when I got into financial service, it was always customer service. Um, I went then and went into insurance for about five years, and um, the insurance industry kind of took a downturn. So I was looking and, and, and kind of experimenting with what was out there. I thought to myself, hey, you know, I love talking to people. I love learning about what they do. Why don't I look at recruiting? Did you even know that was an industry at that point? I really didn't. Um, I've heard about successful recruiters um, and I just didn't know what industries people recruited for. Um, So I'd worked with a few recruiters in the past and I said, you know what, let me give this a shot. And here I am today. What was your first gig like? In recruiting? Yeah. Um, So I had a a manager um, who was all nuclear. He set up a desk, nuclear um, engineers and nuclear salespeople. So uh, my parents were both engineers. My dad was actually a nuclear engineer, and so it kind of worked out. I kind of was very curious about that. How does one find nuclear engineers and how does one place them in the industry? So I learned a whole new industry, uh, very successful. I had a great mentor, um, one of the best in the business. Um, people even here and with an MRI know of him. And um, you know, just a great mentor overall. Um, and he built up that curiosity in me, um, helped me tailor the right set of questions to ask people as I was talking to them, and it, it just took off, which I was not expecting. Did you talk to your dad at all during the process? You're like, you're a nuclear engineer. You, you ever get calls from recruiters? I did. Um, I talked to him about the process, and in fact, he was recruited into two of his roles. So <laughs> what do you was, say about his recruiter? <laughs> um, he actually said it was a, a very good uh, recruiter, had a great experience. And so when I was ready to leave that firm, that's the first person I called, and that's where I got hired on. Really? I didn't know that. <laughs> yes. What was that experience like? Um, that was a little bit different. Um, the, they, uh, the, the division here in Chicago that I was uh, recruited in, um, they were more focused in manufacturing here in Illinois. Um, So it was not nuclear uh, recruiting, not recruiting nuclear engineers or nuclear salespeople. Uh, Very different. Um, Full desk, 360 responsibilities. And really what they wanted us to focus on was contract work. Um, I was not a huge fan. I love the direct placement, finding somebody, get them in a role, uh, rinse and repeat. So many people, I think, lump those two together that aren't directly a part of the recruiting industry. They, They think contract staffing and recruiting, it's all the same beast. I've never worked contract staffing. We barely touch it here at Miller Resource Group. You've experienced both worlds. What's the big difference between permanent placement, direct recruiting, and contract staffing? Absolutely. So in manufacturing, most of the uh, contract staffing was built around warehouse workers. Um, So these are individuals that don't have much of a social presence. Um, Their phone numbers might change every few months. Um, They are used to living paycheck to paycheck. Um, So attracting them was very difficult unless you knew where to find these people. Um, In other industries like nursing, um, you know, contract staffing is great. But for the manufacturing industry, we were talking about CNC machinists, warehouse workers, people that tend to not stay very long uh, within organizations. So I think the overall structure um, wasn't set up for success, but there are certain industries and certain positions where people do, my, my parents, in fact, they were both contract engineers. They loved contract. 
Um, they didn't have money taken out for any of their health care benefits. Um, that was all completely on their own. Uh, savings, uh, like a 401k or a pension plan, that was all on their own. But they got paid a lot more money, so they're able to do things a little bit differently. Um, so I think it really depends on the industry that you are recruiting on, um, whether or not contract staffing w might work. Um, in terms of direct placement and uh, permanent hires, um, I just feel like building that relationship, when, when you approach a company, you want a long-term relationship with them. So by bringing them people that will last, hopefully, more than three to five years, um, you see their success over those years, and then you can build upon that and hopefully grow the, the company as a whole. Mm -hmm. Your customers ever ask you about contract staffing help? No. Do you ever ask them if they need help with contract staffing? I don't. No, no honestly, <laughs> I don't. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't blame you. So, <clears throat> Omar, I think the, you know, kind of the, the, the topic du jour right now is, um, it, it is layoffs. People are talking about layoffs a lot, but, but it's such a weird time because there's so many stories about layoffs in the market right now, but it's not most companies. It, to me, it seems like it's, it's a couple of the big tech firms that are having massive amounts of layoffs. And yet, despite all that, all of the customers and companies that we're talking to in that small to mid-sized range, they're still having a hell of a time trying to find people. Am I off base on that? No, no, not at all. Um, I should ask, uh, should I be fearful of a layoff here coming soon? <laughs> uh, but no, Why the hell would you forget that? Jesus. Uh, well, no, I, the, the reason I uh, ask is actually I talked to two people uh, to this morning who were laid off uh, mm -hmm. in the last month. Um, one of them was due to their company or their organization growing too quickly. Mm -hmm. um, they had gotten financing from private equity. Uh, they just completed, I believe, their Series A or Series B funding, um, tens of millions of dollars. And they just grew too quickly and they don't have a product to show for it. So for the next rounds of investments, um, they're going to struggle. They're going to have a hard time getting more funding. Um, so they, they're paying people anywhere from two, three, four hundred thousand and up. And once you build all of that overhead, um, it's very difficult to move forward and, 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 and get uh, to your goal. Um, so they had a significant amount of layoffs at this one company. Another company I talked to the individual today, um, he actually went to his boss and wanted to restructure the sales and marketing department and he came up with a great plan. Unfortunately, the plan did not include himself. Um, so he kind of, worked himself out of a job, if you will. Um, was that on purpose? Uh, no, no, not on purpose. But um, I think he saw the the overall, you know, he'd been there for over five years. And so he saw the benefit of kind of scaling back because they were spending too much. Um, so he just reevaluated things, came up with a solution. And unfortunately, he was not part of that solution. So he came up with a solution and that solution didn't involve him. That's correct. That's correct. Um, sounds very illogical, um, sounds like career suicide, but he's built up such a great network that he anticipates finding a job within the next three weeks. I doubt it. I mean, that company's probably going to give him the best references that he's ever gotten. Yes. I don't know if it's yes. career suicide. It's certainly for that company, but that's an interesting mindset to have. And if you have, I guess, if you have the best interest of your company at heart, um, that's one way to go about it. I'd like to think that uh, companies would show an individual that same loyalty, but man, I don't know. That isn't that is an altruistic heart. You don't hear a, a lot about people having. You don't. You don't. But I think um, in sports, you know, when we talk about sports, a lot of times people see that they, there's not much value that they can bring to the team, whether it's because of the organization and the management. Um, maybe they're not listening to them. And they might have better opportunities to rise above at another on another team. Um, so I think in a lot of cases you kind of have to see the value you can bring. You have to see where the organization is at at that you know time and place, and then see is it the best place for me to succeed and continue my career. Well, I think back to uh, Tom Brady was in, when he was on the Patriots taking a pay cut yep. so they could surround him with better players. I mean now the guy just. Give me every dollar you can because <laughs> he doesn't have that many years left. But right. back in his prime with Belichick, you know, he just wanted to win a Super Bowl and and he was willing to to take a pay cut. But I'm not sure that I'm I'd advocate for that in in this market because 
you know, I, I have some issues issues with sports analogies, but you know, in football there is a hard cap. You can only spend so much money on on salary, and if Tom was commanding thirty percent of that salary cap, then you could only spend so much on other players. But business isn't the same. Mm-hmm. Business, you can spend as much as you're willing to sacrifice and profit on labor. And if somebody is willing to take a pay cut at a company at the cost of profit of the organization, and that person's not the owner, that person's not the CEO, that's not the leader, if they're not willing to do that, I think it's crazy for an individual to, th- to do that. Yeah, um, I feel like you've got to kind of evaluate everything. What's best for you as an individual and what's best for your company? Sometimes those two don't match. Um, so what's best for the company, uh, in this case, wasn't what was best for him. Um, and you, you kind of have to realize it because if you don't come up with that suggestion, somebody else will. And it's just a matter of time at that point. Mm-hmm. I want to go back to the other company you talked to today, the company that grew too fast. That yes. seems to be much more typical than <laughs> somebody <laughs> writing a new org chart that doesn't involve them. Right. Um, that seems to be what I'm hearing a lot is that companies over the past two years, you know, layoffs at the start of 21 due to the pandemic and uncertainty. PPP loans come out. World seems to not be shutting down despite everybody being at home. I mean, especially in manufacturing, automation, and robotics, those companies soared, technology soared. And so the companies not only brought everyone back, but continued to hire like crazy with all of the increased spending during COVID. But it seems like a lot of them overextended themselves. They hired too many, too fast, too ambitious. They figured this trajectory of growth was going to continue to rise. But it hasn't. It's plateaued. Still growing. Economy is still doing well. Companies are still doing well. Just overextended themselves. But that seems to be primarily with big companies, primarily with tech companies. What does this mean for most companies? You know, the majority of companies in the world in that $5,500 million range. What does that mean for them? Yeah, so... um... I think what's what's important to note is a lot of these companies that are kind of scaling back right now scaled up too quickly. They had the money to invest, they had the capital to to buy land, to start on projects. Um, and as you saw late last year, one of the major, major players in the game, I'm sure you probably know who it is, but one of the major retailers um, who's kind of leading all of this charge decided that they were going to shut down or or not proceed with 20% of their building out plans. Um, So that kind of gave other companies pause and said, well, wait a second, are we growing too fast as well? Um, But what you're still seeing in retail, um, in food production, uh, in manufacturing, you're seeing those individuals, those companies trying to catch up um, because of the labor shortage due to COVID, um, because of people just saying, I'm not working you know, I need to work remote. I don't want to work uh, at a company on site anymore. Um, So you had a little bit of a pullback in the labor market and, you know, that's starting to show across the company. So those who had scaled up too quickly are taking a step back, but those other ones who didn't scale up or didn't have the capital to scale up or are doing it at such a slow pace, it's going to take them years to catch up. So there's still a lot of jobs in those organizations that are helping companies automate their facilities whether it's e-commerce, retail, or in manufacturing. Um, so that, that's what you're starting to see. You're starting to see some of the big players pull back and you're starting to see the mid and small size companies trying to catch up. Um, so it's kind of like the, the tortoise and the hare, right? The race there. Um, so. Yeah, I have a, I don't know. It's, it's kind of between a theory and a hope. Um, a soap, a theory, I don't know. We'll go, we'll workshop that anyway. Um, that I know it's bad for the people who are laid off right now. But I have a hope and a theory that it could end up being very good for those people and for the for the economy as a whole. You know, because we've seen 
so many issues lately with um, with companies be, being unable to hire, not only because of the labor shortage, but because of compensation requirements. And so much of that was coming from these tech companies who were hiring so many people and being able to pay these exorbitant wages and creating so much competition out there for the remaining workforce that everybody had to compete on compensation. Everybody had to pay premium con compensation. And not that people don't be don't deserve to be compensated fairly. I want people to be paid as much as they possibly can and to make it fair. And especially people at the bottom of the ladder, holy cow, are they not being paid enough? Right. But that's a different story. But so now all of the small to mid-sized companies have been killing themselves, trying to hire as many good people as they can. And they've had to get creative on what that good looks like. Mm -hmm. And they haven't been able to compete with big tech, big pharma, uh, big med on the compensation scale. But now with these layoffs, there are so many really great people who got snatched up by these big tech companies that are now on the market. And if these smaller to mid-sized companies who weren't able to hire before are able to attract some of this great talent that was let go from big tech, from the big, uh, big conglomerates, they might find companies that they never otherwise never would have found. Companies that don't have the flashy name like some of those organizations we were talking about that aren't able to offer those tremendous dollars and benefits that those companies were looking for. But now they're searching. They're searching for companies. And if a lot of those people are focusing on finding cool companies, finding cool technologies, finding companies whose values align with their beliefs, and they land with better organizations that they not, would not have found otherwise, and they might be earning slightly less now, just because those mid-sized companies can't always afford those big wages. Who's to say they might not end up being a lot happier, a lot more satisfied, and have an ability to do greater work that they're proud of, and these companies are able to get better people that are with them more longer, that are able to advance their technologies, advance their offerings even further. So I don't know. It's a theory. Might be silver, you know, silver hat. Might be crackpot, but. I'm hopeful. What do you think? Am I off my rock around that? No, no, not at all. And in fact, the two individuals I spoke with today, um, they were completely open and honest with me and honest with themselves. Um, they said, I'm willing to take a pay cut. They realized that they were at larger companies, one with some financing to kind of boost them up. Um, so they understand that their salaries and their total compensation was a little bit inflated. So they're willing to go back to where they were two, three, four years ago for the opportunity to rise up with a company that's, you know, might maybe might not be as large as those other companies, but they have the opportunity to shine within that organization, make themselves known, build something up, be successful, and bring the company up with them. Um, so that's what I'm starting to see, um, you know, in my conversations with those individuals. Do you think these recent recent short term layoffs are going to have a long term effect on hiring overall? Um, well, the employment number just came out last week, three and a half percent unemployment, which is pretty average. You know, if you look at the it's still really good. Historically. It's, it's great. Yeah. Considering. Um, so um, my guess is, is it'll probably hover around that point for the next year or two. Um, it's really hard to predict after that. I mean, you're always going to have companies laying off, but you're always going to have companies hiring. Um, the companies laying off might slow down their efforts. The companies hiring might slow down their efforts. So in the end, it's it's kind of a wash. Yeah, I think um, it's it's almost inevitable that it's despite all of this, it's still going to be difficult to hire, with, no matter what we do, with you know, boomer generation leaving the workforce, eight eight million people leaving the workforce over the next ten years. We didn't make those babies. 15 years ago, so over the next 10 years, there is not gonna be an additional 8 million people entering the workforce. Right. So, I don't know, I think it's gonna to continue to be difficult to hire. So, no matter what, we might it might become a little easier for a lot of companies right now with, these, with the, uh, the layoffs that have been happening in the short term. But I think it's still gonna be a challenge in the long term. What do you see good companies doing to separate themselves from everyone else in order to attract good talent? That's a great question, Travis. Um, I want to, you had the, the, there was a lot right there, and then so I kind of want to break it down a little bit. Um, 
when I entered the workforce, and I'm, I'm not sure if you were in the same situation because there's about there's about a little gap in, in terms of generation between us. But um, when I entered the workforce, um, there was no computer. Everything was done in a newspaper. Mm -hmm. So I would get the Chicago Tribune on a Sunday and there would be about 30 pages of jobs. <laughs> and you go with a pen and you start circling. They were broken down by industry. So you had finance, you had accounting, you had uh, general warehouse, you had transportation. You know, they're break, broken down into various industries. So you would spend a few hours on a Sunday and you know, circle all the ones you were interested. They had an address, you'd send a resume, you'd send a cover letter, put it in an envelope, put a postage on, you know, address it to them and then mail it out and hope you get a reply. There were no phone numbers, there was nothing. You know, it was just a mail and wait game. Mm -hmm. So that, that's changed and, and, and it's evolved over the years. And so I think it's a little bit different. In our industry as recruiters, we are actively reaching out to people who might be actively looking, but 90% of the time they're very passive. Mm -hmm. So unless you bring them an outstanding opportunity, and that, that, that's to answer your question, what makes an opportunity attractive for the individual? Um, I think the culture of the company is very important. Um, and, and that word, I, I struggled over the years in recruiting. Um, five years ago, I had a culture expert for a firm, and he was my the individual that I wanted to take out to the marketplace. But the term is so fluffy. It's so, um, you, you, it, it's, you, you can't put your hands on, on, the, on the word culture. It's not something you can touch and feel. Uh, so I struggled with, you know, really how to market him and what does culture look like to any organization that might be completely different. Um, so that, that word culture, I, you know, being in a company like Miller Resource, I'm starting to see how important that culture is. I really never understood it until I came here. Um, and so I think what, what's important is, is having a culture and, and what is a culture? I mean, it's something that you are a part of. Um, it's something that where you have similar beliefs to the people that you work with. Um, it, it could be something where um, people can be vulnerable with an organization and not be attacked or be ridiculed or, um, you know, you can have an organization that's very open to very different cultures, uh, different beliefs, different religions. Um, you can have companies that are very flexible in terms of work hours, um, a hybrid role, a remote role, a completely work from home or hybrid or work in the office. Um, so there's different ways of addressing that culture and what's most important to an organization. Um, but then I think also as an individual, you and I, we have to take a step back and say what's most important to us. Most people will say God, family, and, and work, you know, or in some order like that. Um, so I, I think for, for you and I, you know, having families, family is very important to mm -hmm. us. Um, and I would probably say it's more important than our work. Um, so knowing what's most important to you, taking that step back, you know, you're not going to put all of your energy into work, obviously, because you've got family, you've got God, you've got community, you've got other things that, that go on in life. Um, but knowing kind of where work comes in and, and putting as much time and effort as you can to be successful at work, I think is very important. So really, before you take an opportunity, you kind of have to envision yourself, how successful will you be in that opportunity? Can that company give you the culture that you want and the flexibility um, to make what's important to you, um, you know, be continue to be most important to you and, and to continue to have that that focus on your family and also be able to, to do the work. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I, what's attractive in a company, I think the culture, the flexibility, um, the opportunity to be vulnerable and uh, the opportunity to get education and grow within an organization because you don't want to stay stale or flat. You want to learn as much as you can. And if you don't have any more learning opportunities at that organization, then maybe it's time to look elsewhere. Well, here's one of the big challenges. How do you advertise that? How do you sell all of those things to not just to a candidate, but people that would never consider your company otherwise? And so much of, we fall into this problem a lot. Candidates will make a decision between one company and another because one company is offering more money. 
And I get it. Money is important. When you, you have to consider it. It's important to you. It's important to your family. It's one of the most important things when taking a position. Is it the most important? Maybe. For a lot of people it is, and that's fine. But for a lot of people it's not. But even if it's not, it's still the most measurable. It's the most tangible thing when you're comparing one company to another. And if a company can't, can't quite compete with other companies when it comes to compensation, how do they sell all of the other things that could make them great? Great question. Um, when I was younger, and you're probably in the same boat as I was, and I, I like to think just looking at my brother and, and my, my younger friends, um, money was probably the most important thing. Sure. When you get out of college, you might have some student debt, uh, some loans you have to pay off. Um, maybe you want to buy a new car, but you're kind of chasing the dollar signs when you graduate from college. Mm -hmm. At least I was. Um, and so you're you're like, I'm going to take whatever job is going to pay me hundred thousand. I'm going to make a hundred thousand when I get out of college. That's six that's figures. The goal. That six was figures. the new thing. Six six figures. That's right. That's right. And I don't know how many people made six figures when they got out. I did it. I made about a third of that. <laughs> so, um, you know, chasing the dollar um, when you're younger, that's okay. Um, but as you grow older, I think there's more things in life that are more rewarding than just money. Um, do you have an opportunity for advancement in your company? Um, I think that's somewhat Stop important. Stop there. Advancement. How do you sell that to a candidate? Not even when they're in the door, When not even when they're interviewing, but to... People out there considering your company, looking for new organizations, how do you sell advancement? <clears throat> yep. Um, I think the advancement piece is going to come um, from taking a look at the organization. What are the opportunities? What are the titles across the organization? Do you want to be in operations? Do you want to be in sales, marketing, finance? Um, what area do you want to be in? And then you take a look at the organization. How many people are in those areas? What are my roads to advancement within the organization to get to, for example, CFO or CEO or, you know, director of sales or VP of marketing. What are, what's the path? And having that conversation during the interview, I think it's very important because I'm not going to have all the answers as a recruiter. I don't work for the organization. I've had multiple conversations and I try to get as much information as I can. But as you're interviewing, I think it's important for you as an interviewee to ask those questions. Um, you know, what are my opportunities? What does my career path look like? Um, how likely or how long will it take me to get there? I think it's very important in having those conversations. Um, one thing when I was interviewing and probably also here too, um, I was always under the impression that you just want to shine. And so whatever question they ask you, um, you know, give me, an, give me a, an example of a very difficult time and, and how you overcame that you just give whatever answer you think they want to hear. And if you give them that answer, nine times out of 10, they're going to call you back and hire you. But I think what's really important is you, as, the, as a potential employee, you have to ask questions that would want you to work there. You want to have answers to the questions that, why do I want to work here in the first place? Yeah, they're going to pay me. Yeah, I'm going to, it's going to be stable. But why do I want to work here? You know, what are those questions? You know, what do your hours look like? What are the, what are the career path options? Um, you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. So it doesn't really benefit you by just giving them whatever answer you want. You're going to get the job. But I, you want to find out, is this the right place for me? Mm -hmm. So I never knew that until I came here. And I heard all of my colleagues say, you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. Mm -hmm. So... I'd always have a bunch of questions ready to go um, because it shows you've done your homework. I'd always do my research about the company. I'd always look at the people there. Um, but you have to find out what questions do you need to have the answers to to make your decision uh, the best decision to work at the, the best place ever. What are some of the questions that you think candidates should be considering? And I know it's not it's not a blanket statement. You can't no. give it and say, you ask these five questions, you'll know if this company is good for you. But sure. What are some things to consider? Um, for, for me, I think the biggest thing is knowing what, uh, we go back to vulnerability. 
Um, what are your biggest challenges as an organization? How have you addressed those challenges? And what do you think over the next two to three years will be your biggest challenges, assuming you solve these challenges now? Mm -hmm. um, what role am I gonna play in solving those challenges? Sure. Sure. Um, you know, what does uh, flexibility, what, what does that look like? Am I required to be here every day, eight to five? Um, is there any flexibility in that? Can I work a couple days from home? Um, you know, after COVID, a lot of my colleagues are working from home full time. Mm -hmm. They're working fully remote. Um, me personally, I refuse to do that. I need to be around people at least two or three days a week. I need to see other people's faces. I need to see what they're talking about. I need to get fresh ideas which I don't get when I'm at home. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a lot of value to working in a, in a workplace where there's others around you. Um, but, you know, everyone's different. Um, someone else might be able to get valuable information just sitting at home working remotely. Um, they might get ideas surfing the internet or reading books or listening to podcasts. There are, there's other ways to, to get there. But for me personally, um, I, I really enjoy working in on-site, on location all the time. And due to COVID, I'm working in somewhat of a hybrid role mm -hmm. and with kids too. <laughs> so. so, so we've talked a, a bit about what, what companies can do to attract, what candidates can do to make sure that they're finding companies they want to be attracted to. What can companies do to get out in front of this problem and keep the great great people working for them that they already have? That's a great question. I, I believe that the, the main thing is staying competitive. Um, and a lot of times people are getting calls from other companies. I talk to people all the time and they say, I get two, three, four calls a week. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be competitive from a monetary standpoint, um, but also you have to be competitive from uh, perks or benefit standpoint. You have to have a good 401k. You have to have good or competitive vacation. Um, you have to have some other intangibles. Um, Talk to know, me about the intangibles. The intangibles, yeah, absolutely. So um, some companies will have um, the, um, I'm trying to think of the word here, the, the flexible spending account, the health savings account. Okay. You know, that's, I don't think that's a huge benefit, but it's also some not intangible. Do. It's very yeah, tangible. Yeah, very tangible. Um, well, I, I hope I'm not calling you out and, and I'm not fishing fishing for compliments but if you were interviewing a candidate for Miller Resource Group and they said talk to me about some of the intangibles here at this company what would you say? Well, I would probably say that um, in terms of a it's like a family you're joining a family. <laughs> That's a dangerous that, that, phrase. That's a dangerous, that is a very dangerous, dangerous phrase. Right, right. I got, I got young kids. I don't always like hanging out with my family very okay, much. Okay, let me, let me, let me rephrase it. It's a, it's a family that you don't have to change diapers for, you don't have to cook for, you don't have to clean for, but they're always here for you. If that makes sense. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I push back on on that a little bit. I mean, don't get me wrong. I. I care for everyone at Miller Resource Group. Uh, everybody that has chosen to work for this company, I am I am passionate about their success. I will do anything in my power to help them be successful. But my family is my family. I think of Miller Resource Group more, much more as a community. You know, you guys are, you guys are my neighbors. We're living to, we're living in the same space. Sure. We're, we're working towards towards a common goal. The more you succeed, the more I succeed, the more we all succeed. And I will do everything in my power to make sure that we all succeed. But at the end of the day, I go home to my family. Mm -hmm. And I get nervous about companies that say we're a family because I love my family unconditionally. Sure. I will literally do anything for them. And I get nervous for people that work at companies when leadership says we're a family because they do they expect that unconditional love, that unconditional commitment to do anything okay. yep. for the company. Yep. And I've I've seen it called work family. You know, some people say they've got their family family and then they've got their work family. Mm -hmm. Um 
But I think in, in some respects, in some instances, you work so hard, you see the, the company being so successful that you, in a lot of times you would do, you know, unconditionally, whatever it takes to, to see other people succeed, um, to, to give other people advice. Um, you know, and I think this just, the, the people I work with, we don't just stop talking between nine and five. We'll send texts, you know, throughout the night, throughout the evening. Um, there's a couple of us that will we'll send a text of what we're drinking that night or what we're eating that night. Um, so it's it's not where we just come here, we work from nine to five and that's it. But we share our experiences with each other, you know, beyond mm -hmm. the nine to five, beyond the work setting. And we've been on, you know, a number of trips together. We go to conferences together. We eat breakfast. We share meals together. We, we do so much together that the time I spend with my family is almost equal to the time I spend with my work family or my, my work colleagues. It's probably more. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's, You know, you can call it a work family, you can call it a family family, you know, wh whatever you will, we're still surrounded by each other and we're always willing to do whatever it takes to make each other successful. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like that's, you know, would you lay your life down for somebody, you know, like you would for a family member? Probably not. But, you know, if, if there was a situation where one of your colleagues was threatened or, you know, in an awkward space, you would stand up for that individual. And I, I hope all of us would stand up. Uh, for each other and um, you know last a uh, couple weeks ago we did an exercise where I asked my colleagues to just write me a little bit of a, a little note um, something to keep me motivated throughout this year and each and every one of them poured their heart out into it and really was very open and transparent with me they all said you know you've got this I have faith in you I'm behind you whatever you need I'm here to support you and I've never gotten that from any other organization I've worked at Mm -hmm. Nobody else has said, maybe a boss or two would say, oh, you've done a good job. You know, I'm behind you. I'm here to support you. But you don't hear that every day. You don't hear that every week. You don't hear that every month. You know, so I think there's something to that where you work at a company and they're encouraging your success and they want you to be successful no matter what. I really think there's a lot of importance and a lot of value to that. Why do you think a lot more companies don't do that? Um... I don't know if it's a matter if they don't feel the investment is worth it or maybe they've never experienced something like that in another organization um, or they just don't think there's any value to it or they just don't think about it. Um, you know, a lot of companies will have KPIs where it's merely a checklist. They'll sit down with their manager and say, OK, did you make 50 calls today? Did you get five new deals this month? Did you close four of those new deals? What does your pipeline look like for the next three quarters? Um, you know, where are you going to be next year? What's your three year and five year forecast? Um, but there's no plan around it. You know, there's nothing like, OK, let's break this down into chunks. How are we going to get there? And I think here at Miller Resource Group, we really take a microscope and we look at, OK, here's where you need to be. How are we going to get you there? Mm -hmm. What do you need to do to successfully get there? You know, how many conversations do you need to have? on a day, on a week, on a month? How many you know, companies, are, are new clients are you looking to get? So I think it's very, um, you know, it, it's written and it's out there and it's very, um, you know, it's illustrated. We can, we can see what it is. Um, where other companies, they just don't have that visibility. They, it's not really out there for their employees to see. Um, I'm not sure if that made much sense, but. <laughs> no, it's, yeah. it, it, it makes perfect sense. It is. It's it's something that is really difficult no. to get out there and and make public and and make visible and you know I still kind of go back to to my original question is how do you sell that how do you how do you ask about that how do you interview for that to find it yeah. and if that's something that's important for you or is it something you just hope and get lucky that it's a company that's going to support you that's going to be hopeful for your success and i don't think there's a boss in on the entire planet that isn't hopeful that when they hire someone they're going to be successful but there are certain levels of leadership that is rooting for success versus waiting for failure so 
anyway, we've talked a lot about this and we're, we're coming up on time. I did want to talk to you for a couple minutes about, about your specific industry, ab- sure. about, um, about material handling, about robotics, about, about logistics. What's, we hear so much about supply chain logistics, but it does seem like it's calming down a little bit. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. Um, you know, obviously COVID has started to come down. We're seeing a spike in China now all over again, but you know, it, it seems to be manageable and they seem to be doing an okay job. But I think um, the supply chain crunch, the supply chain issues were a lot of it because of items that were coming out of China. Mm-hmm. And then the whole, um, the ships were just getting stuck in, in um, you know, in the shipping yards. So a lot of the product was there for months and months and they didn't have the, the proper um, logistics or the proper equipment to, to take everything off of those containers, get them off the ships. Um, and get them onto the customer. There weren't enough drivers for trucks. You know, the whole labor sh- supply uh, shortage and it was causing a disruption in the supply chain. So um, we still do have uh, a shortage of truck drivers, a uh, shortage of port workers, but going- Shortage of everybody. Yeah. And, and so going back to your point about automation, you know, a lot of these shortages are being addressed by automation. They're starting to roll out these automated trucks that can drive across the country without a driver. Uh, we've seen it in uh, airline um, airports and in, in rail yards where they'll have automated forklifts or automated trucks that can pump gas into an airline or pump gas into a truck. Uh, automated trucks that can uh, take baggage off of an airplane. Uh, automatic carousels that can pick up the luggage and and put it right in front of the customer as they're picking it up. So um, a lot of these jobs where we had shortages of workers, there's been such great engineers that are addressing the issue and saying, okay, how can we automate this? Mm -hmm. And that's what we're starting to see. That's what I'm seeing in my industry. No, it's wild. I was at a conference last week um, and they were talking about robotics and automation. You know, 15, 20 years ago, people were terrified that robots were gonna take all of our jobs. Right. Robots are saving jobs now in all of these places where they can't, can barely find enough workers to, to cover the production that they need. They're filling it with automation and with robotics, allowing these manufacturing facilities to stay open and keep the people employed that are already working there. It's wild how far that has come that it's not a fear of automation and robotics taking jobs it's we need robotics and automation so that we can keep these jobs absolutely right yep so what's next what's next for for your industry for material handling i'm still trying to figure that out travis um if, if i had a crystal ball and i kind of knew which way things were moving I, I would be investing in a lot of these companies uh, but we're starting to see automation in the agricultural space which mm-hmm. i think is very fascinating um, i think indoor for indoor farming particularly is Cool as hell. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you're seeing uh, supply chain shortages in, in terms of food, and so this indoor farming is addressing that both from a, a supply, uh, the demand for for the the food, um, and also creating a supply of, of that food to meet the demand. Um, so that I find that absolutely fascinating, both indoor and outdoor. If you've seen some of uh, the, the the equipment that they're using out in the fields to pick corn, to uh, irrigate the the land, to you know, picking weeds, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's just fascinating that, that they've created machines and robots to do all of this. I'm really fascinated by that. Um, they've also taken it a next st- step into the restaurant business. Um, they've got robots that can make pizzas all the way from flipping the dough to adding the ingredients to cooking it and boxing it for you. Uh, they've got robots um, that are can deep fry French fries, you know, they, it's just wild and mind boggling. but. If you look at it from a wage perspective, not a lot of people, you know, want to fry French fries for eight, nine, ten dollars an hour. You know, it's just they can't not, find enough people at fifteen dollars an hour. Exactly, exactly. So it, it's it's addressing the need for the demand, and at the same time, it's it's addressing the need for the people that just don't want to do it. It's a, a job nobody wants to do. Um, but also, the other thing too is I'm seeing robots not only um, from a perspective of labor shortage, also robots are addressing needs where it's become, it was very dangerous to do things, mm-hmm. um, such as welding. Um, yes, there's a shortage in welders, but it's also a very dangerous and hazardous job to do. Um, so now they've got robots that can actually do a lot of the welding. And in fact, uh, I've seen a lot of companies, they'll, they'll get two or three robots 
they'll have one person kind of overseeing the production of those robots doing the welding, but you're replacing the job of six welders because of their efficiencies. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't have to, you know, take a break to go to the bathroom or eat lunch or, you know, they don't ever get sick. They don't have children who get sick and they have to call off for work. It's always going. The production continues to go on. Um, so we're noticing that in, in a lot of industries, oil and gas, things that used to be very dangerous for an individual, they're starting to make that uh, into a robotic application. Mm -hmm. So I know you said you don't have a crystal ball, but you've got a pretty good gaze on the future compared to a lot of people. If an organization were to try and future-proof their staff as best they could for the next couple of years, what areas would you recommend that these material handling, robotics, supply chain and logistics companies look at bringing on now because they're gonna be so incredibly in demand in two years. It's funny you asked that question because yesterday, last night I was actually looking at um, electrical engineers in a very small Midwestern city, microcosm of the US, like center of the, of the US, small bourbon country. Mm -hmm. And um, you just want to take a business trip down there. I do. <laughs> um, whenever, when, when I was looking at these individuals, I noticed a pattern in that one company was hiring all the electrical engineers in that small little community. Mm -hmm. And they're getting ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. They're hiring every single electrical engineer and they're growing and they're expanding, they're helping other companies automate. So they are, um, I don't know what the word is, but they're they're going out and kind of forerunning, you know, they're they're going out, attracting everybody into their organization. There's nobody left for, for other companies to hire. Um, so I think that's a great way to future-proof your business is by hiring all the young talent in electrical, mechanical, mechatronics, robotics, engineering, industrial engineering, supply chain engineering, having those people on your team i think is really going to future proof your your business in the sense that they know from a technology standpoint what is going to most impact your business um and going back to, to a few questions earlier you know you asked me about the business and how i got in this one of the first things i remember learning um, is kind of a key to success is having that engineering degree as a fundamental mm -hmm. um, kind of as a stepping stone for your career. Now, people ask me all the time, you're in recruiting, you recruit people, you recruit for businesses. What's the best way or, or what do I tell my kids how they're going to be the most successful? And in, and I've been seeing a pattern over the years where most people will go and get their engineering degree. They'll start out with electrical, mechanical, structural, whatever it might be, just a fundamental entry point into technology. Mm -hmm. Once you've got that foundation built, you can then go into business or sales. And I'm starting to see that with a lot of the companies. They want that technical background and they want to hire technical salespeople. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got that foundation of, of engineering, whether it's electrical, mechanical, structural, civil, whatever it is, you kind of get well-rounded in, in that discipline. Uh, but you, you really fine tune that and then you go into sales. A lot of people from that, they'll use that as a launching a point to go either into operations or into management. And if you look at, uh, I'd probably say 90 to 95% of CEOs in this country, that's how they got their start, was mm -hmm. in engineering, sales, business, and then their CEO of the company. The holy grail so, of the candidate search, an engineer know. that can talk to people. <laughs> there it Sorry, is. engineers, I love you. You're doing God's work. You really are. Uh, Omar, thank you so much. It's been great having you here today. Any last thing to add? Any last comments for anyone out there? Um, keep your head up. The economy is going to keep plugging along. Unemployment should stay between three and three and a half percent. Um, and, you know, there's always going to be jobs out there. So nothing to worry about. Nothing to fear. Optimistic. I like it. Well, thank you so much for listening and joining me with Omar Shaboob here today. Uh, appreciate it. Please make sure to subscribe wherever you get your full podcasts. And if you happen to like this and want to leave a review, really appreciate it. This has been Hire the Podcast. I'm Travis Miller. Thank you so much. Thank you, Travis.